Now, I always like to be the uh, last speaker. I, I noted that I'm actually batting cleanup here, so maybe that's some form of flattery. But unfortunately for you guys, you first pick someone who has a true passion and enthusiasm for the topic. Another thing, a reputation for verbosity, so I could keep going and going. And the other thing is my in-laws are visiting from Maryland, and they're at home waiting for me to help finish a tile project in my kitchen. So I very well may fill up a whole 45 minutes here. <laughs> Truly, though, I, I much prefer having a conversation as opposed to just offering a presentation. So as we go along, uh, feel free to note some questions and uh, bring them to the attention of the group. And we'll actually get up and move briefly here, stretch the legs, help with digestion and wander over to the demonstration trailer. A little bit of my background, once again, Milton Geiger, and I'm privileged to serve both Extension and the behemoth on campus, the School of Energy Resources. Uh, I have a split appointment, so I get to answer to both directions. <clears throat> and I primarily deal with uh, energy efficiency, conservation, and community scale renewable energy uh, development, and also dabbling some in the uh, community impacts of fossil fuels. So what I would like to address today is We'll start with uh, focusing on small renewables, but before we get into the specifics of technology and what works in Wyoming and why, why it works, why it doesn't, let's put energy in context in Wyoming. First of all, what do we know about the product that we're replacing? So electricity in Wyoming, are we cheaper or more expensive than the rest of the country? cheaper, significantly cheaper. Depends how you want to look at it. We vacillate between having the cheapest electricity in the country to eh, somewhere in the fourth or fifth uh, ranking. However you look at it, we typically pay about 20% less than the average and we pay half as much again as our uh, good friends out west in California or in the northeast. Now if we look at other fuel sources, natural gas, we produce a lot of it. Do we think it's cheaper or more expensive than the rest of the country? Cheaper, cheaper again, but not by quite as much. And now why is that? Well, when you don't have a lot of people to use the natural gas, the infrastructure costs are spread over fewer people. So it's just a little bit cheaper than the national average. So we're looking at the fact that we have an inexpensive product that we're trying to replace when we're looking at a renewable energy system. <clears throat> but we do have some things going for us in Wyoming. We have a very quality resource. As we were talking about uh, earlier here, we were discussing beets and how the wind took care of some of that Swiss chard or you know, the things you have to do to the strong sun here in the summer. Well, guess what? That's a resource relative to other places in the country. So when we have a less expensive product that we're trying to replace, we also have a better product or a better resource that we can harness. And how good is it? Um, Miami, Florida. What do you think of when you think of Miami? Sunshine, swimsuits, down at the beach, right? Pleasant thought. Oh, no, 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 no. We have a better solar resource for photovoltaic arrays than Miami, Florida. Now, we can't get arrogant. We're not quite Phoenix, but we are better than Miami. So next time, you know, it's uh, negative 15 out and sunny, be like, yeah, yeah, here we go. We got great sunshine here. Take that sunshine state. And there's actually a reason. Let's talk about specifically the solar resource and why it is so good in Wyoming. Well, one, we get a lot of sunny days. We understand that. That's why we like to live here. But there's a couple other factors that come into play that help us even further. Another thing is the altitude. All right, we understand that one. You go for a hike up Medbo Peak, you better put on sunscreen or you're going to get sunburn. We recognize this. There's an, one more thing that comes into play when we talk about solar photovoltaics. We get a lot of cold sun. We in Laramie are privileged to experience some days where it might be negative 30 and sunny. Well, guess what? We get incredible production off solar panels in that day. Now you may scratch your head, if there's some electrical engineers in the audience, they probably won't scratch your head, but when you have a colder, uh, let's put it this way, electrical appliances don't like to be warm. When you add heat to a wire, you add resistance, thus you make it less efficient. So when you have cold sun, guess what? You get better production. So you bring all that together and lo and behold, we've got a great resource. Now that same resource could be used also to heat water, to heat structures, solar thermal. We have a demonstration array there. And on campus, if you're driving by the visual arts uh, building, you'll notice a large solar thermal array on the roof. If you thought it was just a uh, industrial art design, no, 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 that's how they heat the building. So we can directly use the thermal inputs of uh, our strong sunshine as well. And once again, those advantages of having quite a bit of cold sun uh, make the economics of those type of systems better as well, i.e. get the sun when it's cold. 
<clears throat> now I should talk about wind a little bit here. I actually have the wind turbine tilted down over there so we can get a look at it. And, and by the way, I, I didn't want to put it up earlier with the prospect of storms. I, I will tell you, I was up in Cody last weekend and they got a heck of a storm. I did have the wind turbine up, let's put it this way, they had a beer garden out for the festival, uh, that tent flew away, and another tent flew away, but the wind turbine, uh, well, it, it hung in there, but I got a little nervous. I was waiting for the trailer to take off, so I, I didn't set it up. But we do have a robust wind resource in Wyoming. Isn't it nice that we can call it a wind resource now? It used to be, you know, in Wyoming you don't worry about getting you know, sand in your eye, you worry about getting a rock in your face type thing. Well, we actually do have this great resource. But how do we harness this resource? Well, if you look at wind energy, there's one important component to remember. And I won't run through the power equation on how we extract mechanical energy from the wind and convert it to electricity. There's one thing you need to know about small wind. Velocity cubed. It's not a, something that's dictated by the structure of a wind turbine. It's simple physics. The velocity in the power equation is cubed. Now, if you guys can revert back to your math there, scratch your head a little bit, when you start cubing things, they matter. They matter a lot. So you could be standing out in a 10 mile an hour wind and eh, it feels sort of windy, right? You're standing out in a 12 mile an hour wind, still feels sort of windy. There's a lot more energy in that 12 mile an hour wind. So what that means with small wind is your site location really, really matters. And that makes it a little bit more difficult to put in a small wind turbine. If you look around here, boy, we'd love to put one over at the Acres Farm. Well, look at the things that could disturb the wind patterns. When we look at our wind rows, the wind had come from the west. It'll be slowed down by the trees. We get a lot of turbulence. So the site specific really matters. And that actually makes it so that small wind turbines, when you put them in the right spot, they can produce very well. But you have to understand that resource. Now, if we just look at a solar panel, I can go to a program put together by the National Renewable Energy Lab. We can point it south, put it at the uh, angle of our latitude here. And I can tell you within maybe two, three, four percent what that panel is going to produce each year, as long as it's not shaded. So it's much easier to understand your solar resource. So those are the big components of understanding wind and solar options in Wyoming. Now remember, we have a cheap resource that we're trying to substitute for, but we do have a great resource. Now let's take this into the final discussion. How does it balance out? How do the economics come into play? Well, unfortunately, for a grid-tied solar electric system, and grid-tied means that you're going to put it up on your roof, you're still going to be connected to the utility. When the sun's not shining, you're still going to want to turn on a light switch, right? So you're going to still interact with the utility. That's how most, most systems are installed, be it solar or wind. And the economics, they can actually be challenging in Wyoming. Now, challenging from a pure financial consideration. We're working on a bit of research with uh, the Department of Ag and Applied Economics where we value a renewable energy installation. It could have a measure, only one I'll call out. Actually, we have a, your service in the business school would remind you of this. It has a negative net present value, meaning it doesn't look like a good investment. But guess what? You can value other things about a renewable energy system. Maybe you like independence. It's the same reason a lot of people have their own gardens. If you really put a pencil to it, a lot of gardens really come out on the positive side there. Well, it could be, I mean, there's, but there's a lot of good reasons that people want to do it. So you can value it for that aspect. Well, you can also say, the environment's very important to me. I, things like greenhouse gas emissions, saving intergener intergenerational equity, leaving fossil fuels for future generations to consume or not con to consume, to actually give them that choice. Things like that could matter to you. Other things could matter like, you know what, I just hate my utility. I really hate, fill in the blank, I won't pick on anyone. I want to tell them to stick it. All right, you could legitimately do that now. You could have an on-grid system and produce some of your own power, or if you really wanted to, you could go off-grid, but you must really hate your utility if you elect to do that. <laughs> but you can bring all that into your equation and say, hey, it's got a negative net present value, but on a whole, we'll break it down over the life cycle of, of a solar electric array, which does have 25-year warranties. We'll say the last for about 30, and it could cost you $15 a month if you want to look at it in pure financial terms. You could say, well, I kind of like $15 a month. That's okay. I know my price of my electricity going forward. I have these environmental benefits. And I was just talking to somebody who actually has an install back there. Maybe you like to race out to the mailbox each month and see how much you didn't have to pay your utility, how much extra you produced. There's a whole lot of things that you can value into that that say, all right, that's worth it to me. And really what we look at is trying to maximize 
or shall we say minimize the cost so people can maximize their benefits. So with that, we're getting towards the end, so I'm going to get you up and stretch you out here, and we'll wander over there and we'll point to a few systems that I turned on. What we have here are the solar electric array. These are 170 watt panels, and people often ask about durability. So what is durability? Well, they all come with a 25 year warranty. Those panels themselves are 15 years old. They're a fairly old panel. Uh, oh, Glenn came over. Yeah, they go down the interstate at about 70 miles an hour, not a, not a mile an hour over. But they do go down the interstate set up like this, so they're a good bit of wind tolerance. They have sat outside in Laramie for the last 15 years, so they take any hail and anything else that comes that way. And when we dug this trailer out of uh, been sort of in quasi mothball about three, four years ago, we plug it in, there we go. So they are impressively durable. But solar panels, just like plants, are using visible light to produce electricity. What is it doing? It's exciting electrons. Visible light hits it, electrons get excited, they flow in one direction. That's a direct current. And now with a direct current, it might be nice for 12 volt in your RV, but you really don't want to use that in your home, right? So if you have a grid connected system, you have an inverter. An inverter takes that direct current, turns it into a beautiful sine wave, 60 hertz, for your residential. I can plug my laptop into this and have no problems. It's actually probably better electricity than you're getting from the grid. So we have DC coming in, AC going out. Now, one component I have here that you would not need at home, but it's very handy in a demonstration trailer, so when you pull up and you're pointing north because you don't have another choice, we do have a battery bank over here. Now, what do battery banks do to the complexity of a system? They increase the complexity, they increase the cost, and guess what? That's a hundred year old technology. That's a lead acid battery. These aren't lithium. I didn't pull these things out of the trunk of a Tesla. These are a technology that's, well, shall we say it's evolving, but right now that's gonna be what, uh, what breaks. It's, it's seven to 10 year life expectancy on that, and it also decreases the efficiency of your system. You can say you're pushing the electricity through one more thing. It's better just to connect to the grid, there go your electrons. If you use them at that particular junction, great. If not, they fly out and somebody else gets to use that electron and you can pull the green hat off and say, hey, I produced green energy. That's a solar electric system. For you Aggies out there, I am doing something right here. Uh, this is a solar powered stock livestock watering system and it actually just runs directly off the panels. Uh, you could have one panel and pump this, uh, run this pump this particular model pump about three gallons from 120 feet. So there are a lot of direct ag applications or direct low pressure irrigation systems, uh, drip irrigation if you want to do it that way. Uh, yeah, don't worry, it's just a blue dye. You know, I found it mixed in a bottle of 2,4-D, right? And put it, it'll be fine on the beets. No, it is some non-toxic dye in there just so we can see what's going on. Now, this is the last steps I'll make you take today before we get some questions. Got one more thing going on over here. Now we have the wind turbine over there, but like I said, I didn't set it up, but there you're simply extracting the mechanical energy of the wind. But something that may be a little less familiar, here's the solar thermal system. And I didn't have it running earlier today, water's still fairly warm, and hey, this is a simple technology. You've got a pump, it brings water up into a manifold, and it heats it up. How hot can it get it? Well, on certain days at the university, because it's a pressurized system, they've had 450 degree fluid in that, so it can get hot. On a residential system, this could heat up water easily to 180, but at the very least, it's going to heat your water up some way. So if you start with 45 degree water, you have one of these, it could certainly heat it up to 75, and then you could take it the rest of the way with your standard water heater. So it can reduce your inputs. How does it pencil out? If you're on really cheap natural gas in town right now, eh, not so good. If you're heating your water with electricity or propane, yeah, it's certainly something to look at. We put years ago and in the summertime when I use the solar clothes dryer, it has lowered the monthly bill and, and rates have gone up, about $25. And it's... Sure, so how, it, you know, the production, the other thing we have to look at these is you want this unlike electricity which you could send in the grid and somebody's going to use it at any time you need to be able to use the energy when you get it so if you have a great summer load that you can uh, use this it enhances the value of the energy that you're going to produce out of it so it's very important to recognize how you're using energy if you're able to use it in the summer it'll even make the payback a bit better on this but under the right circumstances is certainly something to explore how's, it function? how's this function 
like I said, I like this technology. Why? Because it's simple. I've got a DC pump right here. It's pumping out of a bucket. That's about what a system's going to do. Uh, I, I hope your plumber makes it look a little better. Remember, I'm an economist that gets to wire and plumb things on occasion. And in this particular system, it's called an evacuated tube. There's other models. You can have a flat plate. And there's a manifold up there. And these tubes, so it is a vacuum in there. That's why it's better insulated, works well in cold weather. And it's got a copper rod coming down it. Heat heats up the copper rod, goes up to the manifold, water flows across the manifold, down into the bucket. It warms it up. And it'll keep warming up until you hit the temperature that you want for domestic hot water, say 120 degrees. You could also use it with a hydronic in floor heating system as well. Good question. All right, with that, I'll open it up to any questions that I got you up and move around. Sure. So this this particular size right here, uh, this isn't even a household. For a, these are older panels. Newer panels would probably be 220, 240 watts. These are 170 watts a piece. Um, average home, Ron. Do you mind sharing the size of your uh, solar array? 21, 21 panels. It uh, produces about 750 kilowatt a month. So in the summertime, like you said, I get to go down to the post office and bring home a bonus because I'm making money in the summertime. And the nice thing about it, I'm Rocky Mountain Power. So to answer an economic question, you say, where's the benefit? Well, it's a direct trade-off. It's probably not close enough to you. It's a direct trade-off. So what happens is the first 500 kilowatts are fairly inexpensive, the Rocky Mountain. They're like 4.3 cents. Over 500, they go to 10.6. So you don't, want to, you don't want to buy any kilowatts over 500. So if I can produce enough to keep from buying 500, I have cheap power. But if I use power beyond that at 10.6, but I produce more power than I use, they give me credit at 10.6. So I, I gain the 10.6 on the power. So right now they're raising their rates 2.2%. That's money in the bank. That's more, that, that makes my device pay off faster because every other year they raise their rates two and a half percent. So in a 20 year span, your rates are going to go up 15, 20 <laughs> percent. So that cuts down the expense on that, plus you have a 30 percent uh, federal tax credit. So if you play all of the games right and you decide to do some various economic factors of buying a house or doing something and you have capital gains and all kinds of garbage and you can use that 30 percent federal tax credit along with that you can reduce the cost of this unit quite a bit how many years do you think it's going to take to pay off your system it'll never pay it'll never pay off i i honestly don't think that from a financial point of view dollars and cents it will pay absolutely my system cost me thirty thousand dollars but I also saved a percentage of that because I was able to utilize tax credits for various things that I did last year. So I reduced that several thousand dollars already. Uh, there's a certain snob appeal. You drive a Prius, you're proud. <laughs> I got a Prius, I get 40 miles to the Well, so part of that is strictly that. It's like he said, I can, I can turn to Rocky Mountain and say, guess what, I got a bonus this year. You know? So part of it is just extremely that. You can be green, uh, but I don't honestly think, in reality, that even with tax credits using the max of 30%, reducing that down to 21000 over a 10-year span, probably not, because I'm looking at maybe oh, seven, probably $900 a year savings on electricity. So in 20 years, I'm looking at 18000 on a $21,000 investment. It's close, but it's not going to be absolute. And, Thank you. and that's where we are right now in the economics. Okay. What happens to the power that your solar panel is creating if you're not using it? Sure, sure. And that's what net metering is. Net metering is a law in Wyoming. If you put in a system under 25 kilowatts, your utility has to let you net meter. Can't make it difficult. Now, the best description I can put to it is, so you're producing electrons and you're not using them. You're away. Well, guess what? During the day, 
especially with the solar array, if we look specifically at solar, that's really when most utilities have their highest loads during the day and actually moving into the evening. So those electrons simply go into the grid, somebody else uses it. You generally don't care where an electron comes from and you would get to then bank that. So say you put 20 uh, kilowatt hours into the, that's a pretty big system, into the grid during the day, well you could pull that back at night or if you're, as Ron was saying, if you produce more than you consume over a given month, the net metering allows you, uh, net metering law actually allows you to bank those, say, and you can use them in subsequent months. Well, what happens if you're not close to the grid where you can sell them back? Sure. Then you're going to want to have a battery system. You're going to want to save them for when the sun isn't shining. So if you're entirely off grid, you add your expense, but those can be very cost effective systems if you've got to pay $50,000 to bring a power line out to you that simply gives you the right to buy electricity. So then you would uh, charge a battery system. And if the batteries get charged up, then what happens? I've got okay. Like this. Sure. What sure. A neat thing about a solar panel is it can short itself uh, without getting too geeky on it. Uh, you take the load off it, voltage goes up, and it just does its thing. Electrons get energized, and they sort of move back and forth. And until you put a load on it, uh, you don't produce it. So that's, that's one nice thing about solar. I can leave it parked out there when everything's charged up and a way you, you know and it isn't going to short itself out or blow up the batteries i don't have to have an electric heater on here to have a dump load good question efficiency like on your inverters how much do you lose by going through an inverter changing the dc to AC? they've gotten a lot better but yeah you're going to lose about 10 percent uh some are down to eight but yes anytime you uh you do that you do lose production got a question over there well um so they're not Ah, uh, net present value, my net one value. economic like, suppose, nerd term. Suppose something happened to Wyoming, like they hooked up our coal-fired plants to Northern California, and our power went up from 11 cents a kilowatt to 44 cents a kilowatt. Well, then, what would that do to the... Well, if you have a, that's called a high energy escalation rate. If you think... Uh, something's coming that I don't know about or the Energy Information Administration doesn't know about. Well, these are great. Unless the government figures out a way to tax sunshine, you should have a fixed cost. You know what it is going forward. As far as you're uh, concerned about if we actually were shipping power around, well, one, we do that right now, but we have regulated utilities. So even when we ship extra to other states, they first have to, uh, shall we say, meet our needs, and the Public Service Commission regulates that. So we don't have too much of a concern that something like that's going to happen. Anyways, California won't take our coal electricity anymore, so we really don't have to worry about that. But yes, if you have a higher energy escalation rate, if you want to, even if you put in a 3% real energy escalation rate, the numbers Ron was giving, would he would get it back in 20 years and then some. Do you have any knowledge of how efficiency will be improved in technology? Sure. Efficiency, improvements in technology is a question. Well, the Department of Energy has a very creatively named program called the Sunshot Initiative. No, it's not the Moonshot. This isn't Kennedy. We aren't going to the sun. But their goal is to take these panels. If we'd had this conversation four years ago, eight and a half dollars a watt installed. Have this conversation right now, four and a half to five dollars a watt installed. Department of Energy's goal by 2020 is to have it at one dollar a watt installed. And actually, a lot of the cost now. These panels, when they come off the factory, and we can thank China for this and other manufacturing techniques, are about 60 cents a watt. So everything else is soft costs. What are soft costs? Permitting, structure, installation. Would you believe it or not, in Wyoming, a lot of times permitting can cost more than the panels itself. But anyways, the trend is to bring the cost down through improving that whole system-wide look at it. Uh, and then we'll, of course, look at technologies, thin film, putting it on plastics, putting in things that are cheaper than silicone. That's a goal. Sure. If you really want to maximize production, you do clean it. But in most years, we get enough rain that it'll take care of itself. Uh, so you do lose some production with dust. Uh, the thing that can actually impact production, it's, it's sort of disgusting. But if you have a real pigeon problem or you really like to feed the birds, an issue like that can emerge as well. But anytime you shade it, shading matters. It really does matter. So uh, if people really want to maximize production, they'll be out there cleaning it. But most people don't. Ron, do you clean your panels? The snow and the rain, they stay clean. Yeah, I, I've never cleaned these really, so. Good question though, real good question. Anything else as I'm keeping you from heading to your cars? <laughs> nope. What's the energy production in a panel's life versus the energy input to make it? 
Excellent question. So we have, what is the, really we're talking about the energy balance. So what does it take to produce a panel versus what will it produce over its life cycle? Now, a federal lab, National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado, actually just did a study on this because uh, it is a hot topic. It's about nine months is the energy balance, and that includes delivery. So it is pretty good. Um, the technology, it's almost like stamping these things now. So the manufacturing is uh, quite efficient in transportation. Uh, it's all factored in that. So it's actually, I think it's 9.3 months, if I recall. I just read it about, a, about two months ago. So very good question.